us, and it's not because we're smart or caught up on current events or that we know the Bible so good that you're going to give us something this morning. It's because we came. So, Lord, I pray for everyone who's here and everyone who is listening, everyone who wants to come, would just come. We're coming to behold you, Jesus. And I pray, um, yeah, Lord, that would you just, uh, by your spirit, um, fill us with that come, Lord Jesus, cry. God, I pray that you would fill Tom with your peace and your joy, that we would have joy as we climb this mountain together. And I pray you do some kind of miracle, Lord, that uh, more than ever before, we would feel like a body while one person is has a microphone and is talking. But Lord, would you unify us and make us one? In Jesus' name. Man, good praying. I'll start praying. So that was all-star praying. Actually, that was um, really anointed worship as well. I just feel like this, the message has already kind of been preached in worship, the songs that these guys are picking. And just, God, we just thank you for worship teams that pray about what to sing, what to, how to lead us into your presence. And I just thank you for the, the uncoordin- uncoordinated coordination you've put into this place so that we see this week after week where... Worship team sings things, and the prophetic people prophesy things, and the intercessors pray things, and the psalm, psalmists read things that all intertwine into a divine message from you, not from any one of us. I just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, consecrating the assembly. If you've got a got Bible... It, you should. Uh, Zephaniah 1. Can we go there for a second? It's not in the notes. Zephaniah is late in the Old Testament. How many of you guys know that Jonah like keeps coming up in the prayer room? Anybody noticing that? Jonah? Was that being sarcastic? You, you haven't heard it once, really? I've been in sets with you where it's come up. Okay, that's weird. (laughs) David, am I lying? Okay, thank you. (laughs) Yes, so, okay. God is highlighting certain passages right now. The story of Jonah, he's highlighting it right now. Jonah in the the story of Jonah is the church. Zephaniah, God is highlighting Zephaniah 1 and 2 right now, like in a very intense way. Okay, and so... Right now, uh, I appreciate Jen praying. You don't have to know everything about world events to follow what I'm about to say, but I'm going to set a little context. I put something on the online prayer room if you want more evidence or more in-depth kind of, hey, I'm really interested in that. But if you, you don't really need it for what I'm going to say. But I just want you to look with me for a second. Uh, Zephaniah 1. Now, if you, this is my Bible, and all that writing is since January, like God takes me to Zephaniah 1 literally every day. Every day he talks to me about it, and then he takes me other places. But this is uh, what what I feel like he's saying. Starting in um, verse 7. Be silent. I mean, we could just read the whole thing, but I'm not going to. Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. God is actually inviting people right now into Jerusalem, like in mass, like tons of people into Jerusalem, not just Samantha and I. He's inviting you guys into Jerusalem. Like it has nothing to do with getting on a plane. It's got to do with being a part of what he's doing right now. And he's inviting the whole world. Like the whole world is about to do a, all kinds of stuff in Jerusalem, not just pray. <laughs> They're putting their hand to Jerusalem. Okay. So he's invited them all. God has invited them all is what that means. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children. And all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. He's talking to the leaders of Jerusalem right now. Um, In the same day, I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Who knows why people would leap over the threshold? Anybody know? It's a superstitious thing. Like, it's a a false religion thing. Okay? He's saying, I'm going to judge the compromised in the same place. Like, those who worship Jehovah, but they just cover their bases by... Leap over that threshold too. And there shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate, a wailing from the second quarter, and a loud crashing from the hills. Wail, you inhabitants of Maktesh. Now, when I started reading this passage, I'm like, God, what is Maktesh? And he said, look it up. 
<laughs> so I did. And Magtash is actually a little area outside of the city of Jerusalem where the silversmiths worked, and they made coins. It's, a, it's actually where they made the money okay, and traded. It was a merchant place. All the merchant people, which I didn't have to look it up to know this because it said it, but I just didn't know what it was. For all the merchant people are cut down. All those who handle money are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Now, this isn't because they are ambivalent about God. They're tired. They're tired of waiting for God to do something good or to do something evil, either way. Therefore, their goods shall become booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. So when you hear about it, it's tempting to be bitter, to just feel like, oh, this is bad. But there's really nothing to do about it but feel bad about it. You don't want that to happen to you. You don't want to be bitter about the day of the Lord. There the mighty men shall cry out. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The day of the Lord is these things. Don't listen to people that say the day of the Lord is the moment the whole world comes to a worship meeting and is like, this is amazing. Let's all go into heaven together. That is not the day of the Lord. That's, a, that's an American construct. That, that comes from people that are rich, wealthy, and think they have no need. That they're like, oh, we're all just going to all get it one day and go into heaven together. That is not going to happen. The day of the Lord is these things, okay? The day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities, against the high towers. Now, one of the words that came out at New Year's Eve, and the Lord's been speaking it, is going to tear down the high places. There is a financial judgment that's going to tear churches down. It started already. It's already begun. It's like <laughs> Ragnarok. Can't stop Ragnarok. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't need to know. It's just a joke about a Marvel movie, but yeah. It's already started. Okay. So, I'll bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, because they've sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. Everybody say jealousy. God is a jealous God. For he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. Now, don't break with the chapter break. <laughs> the chapter break came after the prophet wrote these words. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. This is why you don't want the noise of this to be bitter in your heart. Let it be joyful. Let it be, oh, this is the time to give everything to the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you meek, of Jerusalem. Is that what it says? No, it says of the earth. This isn't a message to Jerusalem. This is saying when you see this in Jerusalem, know it's coming to you. What starts in Jerusalem is always going to come to the ends of the earth, always. This, what you see happening in Jerusalem, if you see it, it's going to come here. So right now, last night, yesterday, there were, by most accounts, somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 people protesting a right-wing government being established in Jerusalem. They've been protesting for, I think it's like 30 days they've been protesting like this. It's growing. It's not getting smaller. At the very same time, a very specific financial judgment is occurring right now. There's a bank. You don't have to know all this. I'm just going to tell you so you got context. There's a bank called Silicon Valley Bank that failed this weekend. Silicon Valley Bank is the startup bank of the world. Like most tech startups have some holdings in Silicon Valley Bank. There's like $250 billion that are like hurt, gone. I mean, they're not gone, but they're in question at this point. This is starting to, it's contagious. So the Bank of England has a Silicon Valley Bank connection, and there's startups in England that are scared that they're going to run out of payroll money. But Israel is really, really affected by this. So the, the, the prime minister, even though all these protests were happening yesterday, he got on the news yesterday, and he's like, I'm paying attention to Silicon Valley Bank. From Rome, he said this, I'm paying attention to Silicon Valley Bank. Don't worry. We will bail you out. You can't bail anybody out. Do you see what it says? It says, neither shall their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Israel should be repenting. <laughs> Israel shouldn't be protesting. Israel should be repenting. The right-wing government that's elected, it's not good. But neither are the protests against it. They're just a reaction. Do you see what I'm saying? There's no, there's no human solution to anything. 
There is only repenting for saying, God, we've gotten way far out of your will. We're way far afield right here. But I want to give you just a tiny history of how this happened, okay? This is really specific. This is specific to Israel judgment, the Silicon Valley Bank failure. Not just Israel. It's the whole world. Israel's shaken among the nations. So just follow me for a second. In November of 2021, so a little over a year ago, God told me, I'm going to start a youth movement in Israel on December 15th, 2021. He says it's going to be a financial judgment along with it. So if you know anything about the economy, you know inflation started to ramp up globally and specifically in America in January of 2022. Like the very first measurements, they were like, oh, we used to be at less than 2%. Now we're at 7 8%. Those very first measurements happened right at this time. There was also a youth settler movement that started on December 16th in Israel. But if you know anything about the time, the way time works around the world, when it's December 15th here, it's December 16th there because it's about a half day off, okay? And then what that happened was somebody got killed in a settlement in in Israel, a guy who was a a dad of two young people. And what's called the Hilltop Youth kind of lost it. And they invaded a Palestinian village. And it it started a series of settler youth invasions throughout Israel. It's been happening for about a year now. It's still happening. The most recent one is Hara that it just happened at. Now, when that happened, two kind of important political guys, they incited it. They were like, yes, you have political backing from us. A guy named Ben Ver and a guy named Basil Smatrik. Those guys, they became beloved by this movement. Now, the government of Israel collapsed in in the last year, and they called for elections. And the current prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, was the former prime minister. He enlisted these two guys because they had the heart of the youth in Israel. And he won the election. And these protests that are happening, they're protesting this election because this is a violent movement. Like, it's, it's... contrary to many of the values that Israel holds. They're trying to change the Constitution to limit the amount that the Supreme Court can affect decision-making in Israel. So there's hundreds of thousands of people protesting. Well, as part of this protest, the tech giants in Israel moved their money out of Israel. They told the government, if you guys don't slow down and stop, we're going to move our money offshore. And they did. Do you know where they moved it? SVB. Listen to what I'm saying. Which one's righteous? They're godless. It's, it's, it, it, but they have God. We're godless, but we have God. There's so many things we're afraid other people are going to do that we try to manipulate by using our strength to get other people to do the thing that we think they should do. We protest instead of pray. And he's saying, this will not work. This is the judge. It's, gonna, it's starting here. Yes, it's going to go to the ends of the earth. We're no more righteous than the people of Israel, unless we are. And the only way that we are is by dying to ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Jesus. And that's what this is talking about. It says, gather yourself together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth. You have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So if you want to be hidden from what's, I guarantee you what's coming here. I guarantee you what's happening, it's, it's not going to go away. In fact, yesterday, I was watching the news Saturday, Sunday, or yeah, Saturday and uh, this morning. And at first people were like, this, there's no contagion. Everything's kind of covered. There's no risk. But world leaders are starting to talk about it more and more and more. And they're saying Monday, it, the pedal is going to hit the metal on Monday. The decision making that happens Monday, most people are like, this is going to determine what happens. That's not true. God's determining what happens. You're not going to get out of judgment that way. You can't buy your way out. You can't manipulate your way out. You can't protest your way out. You can only humble yourself and accept. We got bad leadership because we like bad leadership. We got impatient leadership because that's what we like is impatience. We got a human solution because we like human solutions. God forgive us. We don't want that anymore, right? So, Lord, I'm asking, as I, as I preach this message you've given me, would you help us, Lord, to just connect this to our world But this wouldn't be some Bible thing. This would be an our world thing in Jesus' name. Item one, God is a God of order. God's kingdom is a government. Government equals order. So when we talk about God's kingdom, it's very easy to make that something in our hearts or in our minds that it's not. It's easy to make that like some kind of 
word that just means everything, but that it, it, it governs everything, but the kingdom itself is a government. It's order. We actually want God to be bringing us more and more into order. Now, right now, the church is tempted into disorder. It's because God's pouring out his spirit. Where the spirit is, is moving, the flesh is always moving along with it. And so there's a large portion of the church that just wants to shake things up and get something going. God's going to do that, so you don't have to help him with that. That's actually the warning is that God's going to do that. What we want is when that happens, and some of you might remember many years ago, I was at a different church, and I drew a picture of a cross with a bunch of people on, on it in arrows all pointing different ways, and I said, someday God's going to pour out his spirit, and whatever direction you're pointed, you're going to go that direction. You want to be pointed down the cross. Now, the message I'm going to preach here this morning, this is the message that got me pushed out of the last church, this message. So you might be like, oh, I agree with that. That sounds great. But I want to tell you the flesh hates the message I'm about to preach. It hates it. Okay? And we might not even realize we hate it and hate it at the same time. So I would just suggest, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how does this change me? Not how does it put me, push me in the same direction I am right now. How does it change me? Okay? God's kingdom is a government. A government equals order. God likes order, including order in meetings. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 33. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three, or two or at most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. You know, this is hard. When two or three prophets speak, five or six prophets are like, I got something to say too. Like, we actually want to be like, is, it, is this my time? And I'm not talking to you. I'm actually talking mostly to me because I, this is the one I'm like, God, just want it. I have to because God told it to me. That's not always true. That's not always true. Okay. So I'm not really preaching to you something I don't feel the pain of. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy. One by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. He's talking to the whole church in Corinth. He's saying everybody here can prophesy. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The flesh, you, me, what we think, what we feel, what we want to do, the flesh wants God to do something outside of the ordinary. We come to meetings actually kind of hoping God will do something outside of the ordinary. God is trying to mature us out of that, Okay. God wants to put us to put on restraint, to give ourselves to a new order. He, God is looking for us to be something extraordinary. He already is extraordinary. The fact that we meet together, the fact that he provides us worship leaders, the fact that we have heat, the fact that we have breath, the fact that we can offer him worship, that's all extraordinary. In, in light of the fall, we should all be dead. That he's already doing amazing, extraordinary things all the time. What he's looking for is for us to offer him something completely not human-like, called self-control, patience, joy, peace. Do you see what I'm saying? We're, we're here actually to serve God. That's what that means. To give ourselves to an order, or, new order. Judgment is an invitation to order, not instability. So God is judging the earth to bring us into order, but if we react to the judgments, what we find is we become more and more unstable. How many people felt like they were more stable in COVID? Or, yeah, how many people felt like they were more stable when COVID first hit? Like, you're like... Plodding right along. This is what I was expecting. This. this is good. No, it was kind of made us unstable, right? We're like, wait, what? how do I find my footing in this? Well, God's merciful. He does this slow. He does this so that we can learn, so that we can learn how to walk through judgment. But the goal is to become more stable in judgment so that there's a witness on the earth that we know who's doing this and we know why, right? And so that's what he really was inviting Light Hop into right now is stability, to actually be a witness that this isn't some accident. This isn't something we don't know about. We actually can know more about it. And he wants us to not react to the next things that happen, but to prophetically respond before they happen, okay? Now, he did that a little bit here, even with COVID. He told us about COVID before it happened. And we responded before it happened. But we still found ourselves just a little bit like, whoa, hey, wait a second. But we also found our footing pretty quick, right? And that's good. He likes that. Now, this is not a condemnation message. Okay, now reaction is an expression of instability. Surprised, unfounded, late or early, out of sync with heaven. That's what reaction is. Dane, when you play baseball, 
a really good hitter, are they, can they just react to whatever's happening, or do they kind of have to, like, be just slightly ahead of where that ball's going? Slightly ahead. They kind of have to know, right? If they're just reacting, they're not going to be a good hitter. So we actually, it, it's not a lot ahead of it. It's just, okay, I can connect with what God is doing because he told me about it. I kinda, I've, I've practiced this enough. I've learned enough about how this works. I can actually excel in this. That was the word God gave me in Steph's uh, meeting. I'm just thinking of that right now. Uh, the prophetic art, that was my word, excel. God put the early church in the upper room to bring it in sync with heaven into one accord is what that means. He put that church in that room so they could connect with the right moment in time and thousands got saved. Do you see what I'm saying? We want to do this. We actually want to come and get ready to connect with whatever God is about to do. That's the spirit of prophecy. Prophetic response is an expression of stability. It's founded on something. It's founded on a rock. It's timed. Like, okay, but the spirit of prophecy tells us stuff and shows us explanations of stuff that's happened to edify us, to comfort us, to give us peace and turmoil and, tri and tribulation so that we can connect with what God's doing. Okay? All of creation declares the goodness of God, which is found in process and rest. Everybody say process. Everybody say rest. That's growth and knowing when to not grow. Now, a tree, if you cut a tree open, Sam was surprised when we cut up, up our limbs and that, that fell from the ice storm, how beautiful it was inside of the limbs because there's rings. What makes those rings happen? Growth and dormancy, right? Growth and dormancy. We can actually count how old that tree is by the rings inside. Okay, so the movement of the stars and the planets, they're in process, like they're moving at a very certain pace in a very certain way that's ordained by God. And it's very hard to measure. Actually, comet, a new comet was just discovered that's going to come near to the earth. People didn't know about it. There's, God does stuff that we don't know about, but he knows about it. He actually knows how to move these things. Okay, the movement of the animal kingdom, fish migration, bird migration. Vegetative growth and dormancy, which I just talked about. Human movements, day and night cycles, the human work weeks. If you're watching the news right now, many, many places are trying to redefine work weeks. The United States is trying to go to a 36-hour, uh, no, a 32-hour work week. Other places, South Korea is trying to go to a more extended than 40-hour work week. Like, everybody's trying to change the times and the seasons right now. Everybody's like, there's a problem. we got to fix it. The problem is time. I need more time. I need, we need to waste less time. Seasons. Well, these seasons, they, like the problem is the heat and the cool. And, do you see what I'm saying? Everybody wants to fix the world. You don't want to get into that. You don't want to react to other people trying to fix the world. You want to prophetically know, okay, how do I connect with what you're doing here, God? The only way you're going to know that is to actually let him tell you, okay? And you receive it in faith. Now, Psalm 19, 1 to 9, this actually talks about this reality that the heavens declare the glory of God. And it talks about the sun moving across the, the sky in an ordained course. And then, he, then David goes on to say, because of this, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, this verse 7. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord, the order. The government of the Lord is good. Get into it, is what he's saying. He's saying the sun, it's on its course. It's going to finish its race. If you want to be like the sun, get into the, the course that God has set for you. Get into the order that God has set for you, okay? And he says the way that you do that is humility. Let him correct you. Let him tell you where you're out of order. So God, I pray, just show us where we're out of order right now. He's been showing me this ever since last Sunday. You know, that was a, an amazing thing that he sent a prophet to tell us we're missing something. And we can get closer to the order just by saying, yes, I agree. Clearly, I'm missing something, right? I mean, that's kind of obvious. We're all missing something. Otherwise, we wouldn't come here, right? That's great. That was like, keep going. That was a keep going. You're missing something. And she said it so nicely. Okay. Now, everything has a season. This is the basic of God's design. God is a God of order, timing, and process. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8. To everything. What's, what's excluded from this? Nothing. Zip. Thank you, Tim. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted. And I, was, I had the whole thing in here, but I was like, man, I'm going to run out of time, Lord. And he said, yes, you are. So I took it out. Okay, if we're out of sync with God, all of our effort, even for God, is wasted and counted as rebellion. Listen to what I'm saying. If we're out of sync with God, all of our effort, even for God, is wasted and counted as rebellion. He doesn't need us to do anything for him. He's looking for us to come into his kingdom. He wants us in the order. 
He wants us in the structure of his government. God likes to birth things. Psalm 127, 1 to 5. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Now, God never said to the church, church, go build yourself on the rock of Peter. He said, I will build my church. He doesn't want us to build him churches. He wants to, us to let him build us. And if we'll do that, he'll build churches. Okay? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Is God telling me, Tom, stop waking up at 4 a.m.? No. He's telling me, if you think waking up at 4 a.m. is going to make you more righteous, you're missing it. Just live with me being God, you being the child. Let me move you, okay? God is inviting us to order before he pours out his spirit. God's getting this place ready to pour out his spirit. The pouring out of the spirit isn't a one-time thing. The story of Acts 2 is not a one-time thing. That pouring out of the Spirit happened several times in the book of Acts. God started pouring out his Spirit last week in a really pronounced way, even before that, a few weeks before that. He's been pouring out his Spirit in this place more and more and more. He's going to pour it out in a dramatic way that it's going to make this place feel unstable for a minute. Pick order right now. Pick order right now. The flesh is going to rise up. I'm not talking about everybody else's flesh. I'm talking about you. You're going to feel uncertain. If you don't respond to the Lord, you're actually going to not know how you fit. You're going to cause trouble for you. You won't really cause trouble for God. But you will cause trouble for you, and you don't want to do that. He's going to, he's going to pour out his spirit, I'm telling you. It's, it's, and it's going to be dramatic, but it won't be the first time. And it won't last forever. It will actually be a very short period of time. And I believe, personally, it's going to fit into 2023. And I think we're going to see the fruit from it in 2024. I've been saying this for months, so this is nothing new. <clears throat> the letters to Corinth... So that 1 Corinthians 14 that we just read in the very beginning where he talked about two or three prophets prophesied, the letters to Corinth are letters to a church in revival, a church where the Spirit was being poured out. And David talked about this last week, uh, two weeks ago. The gifts were operating, but the people were reacting, and disorder was resulting. So the gifts were operating. The Spirit was being poured out, but the people were reacting to it, not prophetically responding to it, and so disorder was resulting. That's why, that's why Paul wrote the letters. Now, where the spirit moves, the flesh always moves, always. That's the point of the spirit moving, is to kill the flesh. And it doesn't kill the flesh involuntarily. God will only kill the flesh you offer to him to be crucified. And so he pours out his spirit. Your flesh starts trying to keep up. And then you're like, oh, he actually wants to carry me, not have me run this thing across the goal line. And if we're willing, he'll crucify our flesh and resurrect us in glory. That's what we want, okay? Okay. So where the spirit moves, the flesh always moves. And that's not bad. That's actually the way it's designed. Your flesh will always find God reasons to indulge itself. My flesh always finds a good Bible reason to get out of order, always. So does yours. Okay? So just being like, hey, I got, God told me is not an excuse to run over people. God told me is not an excuse to break authority. God told me is not an excuse to do anything. God told me is, the, is a reason that we get into patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. It's very tempting to be like, well, I got to break through all this order because God told me. That might be the case. But you better be sure God told you. You really got to be sure God told you. God is a God who loves order. And that's why Paul said, if one starts talking, quiet down. Two or three prophesy. He, already, he was dealing with the God told me. Like he was hearing that probably over and over. And he told women be silent in church. And he told men, be silent in church. In the same chapter, in both in, in chapter 14, he said two or three talk, be silent men and women. And he said women, be silent, because there was so much disorder. But he didn't want people to not prophesy. He, he, later he said when a woman prophesies, her head should be covered. Like he wanted women to prophesy in church. What he didn't want is people giving into their flesh because the spirit was being poured out, Okay. Galatians 5, 13 to 15. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, to freedom. Where is freedom at? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In Christ. Both were right. Yep. For you, brethren, have been called to freedom, to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Who wrote this? The Spirit. Very good. This is, the, this is Holy Spirit-led. You see what I'm saying? 
So we'd be like, I got to run over all this. I got to run over all this because the Spirit's talking to me. And the Spirit would be like, I actually said something different than that. I said something different than that. Don't use me talking to you as, an, as liberty to operate in your flesh, but through love serve one another. If you're willing to submit yourself to the Spirit, he will make sure the message gets out. He will make sure. Trust me. And I have violated this more than anyone I know. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the point of the Spirit. The point of the Spirit being poured out, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, it's for the edification of a body. It's actually to learn how to be self-controlled. It's a spirit of self-control. So the spirit of self-control being poured out means that we should actually learn how to be self-controlled and like get along with each other and operate in peace and patience knowing if God wants to bring something forward, he is going to bring it forward. I want to be a part of that, but I don't want to violate God to be helpful to God, okay? That's attention. What I'm describing is the death of your flesh, and that's what God wants. He wants our flesh to die. He wants the pain of it. He likes the pain of it. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. So if you're like, I got to because God said to, he's saying, watch, the same thing is going to happen to you. When I actually give you something, somebody's going to run over it for you. And so I want it to be in order so that everybody can be heard because you reap what you sow. So if you sow, uh, I got to, I can guarantee you're going to reap and I got to. And he's like, you don't have to do that unless you repent. You can repent out of the out of the little system. Okay, and That's what he's calling us to, is to repent out of the little system. Right now, Israel is in a massive shaking. Much tr- trouble lies ahead in the remainder of 2023 into 2024. God is sifting his people, the church and Israel. We must abide in Jesus if we'll prepare. 2024 will be a time the bride emerges as a witness of selflessness and will prepare the way for the Messiah to be seen rightly, like John the Baptist. John the Baptist came and brought Israel an order so that anyone willing could notice that dove lighting on that man and go follow him. And John was like, go follow him, right? John wasn't trying to get a bunch of people at his Holy Spirit meeting. He was actually trying to teach people order so that when the Messiah showed up, people would actually follow him. He was Because all of Israel was looking for the wrong thing. And I want to tell you right now, most of the church is looking for the wrong thing. Jesus wants a witness of order so that when the Spirit is poured out, we'll follow the Spirit of Jesus and not all the false ones that come with it, okay? He said there are going to be many false prophets, many Christs, many false Christs. He says, don't go out and chase them down. Just watch for me. Watch for me being poured out, right? He says, I'm going I'm to come. I'm going to be a sign. So we want to know what he is like. This is how we do that. If we refuse to prophetically, and what I mean is in faith and in the right time, before it happens, respond, like Zephaniah said. If we refuse to prophetically respond and instead react to what will continue to unfold, then we'll be gathered with the tares, and 2024 will will mark the beginning of great delusion and pain. I say that with complete and utter confidence. It is always the right time to abide in Jesus and learn order, always. It's always been the right time to do this. But the prophetic fulfillments around us should create an urgency and a sobriety in our spirit to make this the top priority. Joel 2, 11 to 8. The Lord gives voice before his army. Now, he's speaking of the Antichrist army. The Lord is the one that raises up the Antichrist army. He raises it up just like he raised up Nebuchadnezzar to take Israel captive. Because why did did he do that? Why did God take Israel captive? Does anybody know? Their worship was lawless. And so he smashed Israel their worship spot. When he brought his son to show the world what God was like, they chose a different kingdom. They chose Caesar's kingdom. They corrupted their worship. They kicked God out of the temple. And he came and he destroyed their worship place. God says, it's very tempting to think God should be worshiped no matter how we do it. Like we, The show must go on no matter what. But God hates lawless worship. He hates corrupted worship. He hates impatient worship. So he says, if you want to know about that, look at Shiloh. He destroyed Shiloh, which was the worship center of ancient Israel. He's destroyed many worship centers. But there's coming a time when spirit and truth worship, the order, the love, what Paul's preaching in Corinthians, we live in the most blessed moment in time because we can know these things. We can actually see in real time order and disorder right now. We do not have to suffer the fate of the lawless, but we have to respond in the time period, the set time he's given us to respond to. 
And I believe he's given LightHub a really unique set time. And I think Jen just highlighted it again. Like we can hear these things and be like, God, my flesh rises up when your spirit rises up. Anybody feel what I'm feeling? I feel it. Yeah, God, let's do something about that. You can't fix it. That's the beauty of it. You can only tell him you need, he needs to. You can just say, God, I'm selfishly ambitious. Like when stuff starts happening, I don't want to miss it. I want to be a part of it. I want to grab onto it. It offends me. I want to get out of it. There's all kinds of reactions that we have to it. God, I want to be in the flow of what you're doing. We, the beauty is we have a place designed to mimic the structure of the flow of his government. Like we have a back and forth. Take your turn. Take your turn. Take your turn. Like we have muscle memory just from doing it. We can actually say, God, this, let, help us connect this to that. Like, help us to see you've spent seven years almost getting us ready to flop. He loves you. Like, he's really been merciful and kind and generous with us, right? It's been painful. It's been painful because we, we, I mean, me chief among the just got to. <laughs> I just got to. I was even feeling it this morning. Sam was like, hey, chill. She kind of said that. She said it nice. Okay, so it's always the right time to learn these things. Joel 2, 11 to 18. The Lord gives voice for his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Like, it's a different program. It's a different thing I'm doing. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? You see, God's looking for a witness. Oh, these people, they're led by something totally different because they have a totally different God than the world does. Now, he's saying the same thing Zephaniah was saying. Gather together now while there's time. Like, who can survive this is what he's saying. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. So the point of our prayer room is really not so much what we pray. And the point of prayer is really not so much what we pray. It's getting into the government of God. It's getting into the order. God really, if we're really praying great, God's already telling us what to pray. We're just kind of repeating back to him what he wants in his kingdom on the earth. We're bringing agreement. We're, we're reconnecting what was lost at the fall of man between Adam and Eve and God. Okay. Now, Kalamazoo is a city of refuge. It is which means it's a city of order and chaos, a city of singing and judgment, a city of patience to see wheat from tear. Now, what I mean is you have to wait a minute to see, is that a tear or is that an immature wheat? The tares don't bear fruit at the very last minute. The wheat does. And so we have to, we have to be like Jesus. Jesus was like, there's this parable of this guy trying to grow this tree, and it didn't bear fruit, and the owner was going to cut it down, and the gardener said, no, let me dig it around it one more time. Let's just see. Let's give it a little bit longer. That's the city of refuge. The Levite cities were places, the cities of refuge in the, in, the, in the different tribes' areas were Levite cities, and they were places. If you got in trouble for something, you ran to the, to the city of refuge, and then they waited to see, okay, is this guy guilty or not? That was the point of the original cities of refuge. That's what this place is. It's a place where people will get just a little more time to bear fruit, okay? God's global plan, uh, it's a city of refuge to the point where we agree with it. God will agree with it to the amount we agree with it, is what he said to me this morning. God's global plan is to get anyone willing into the tabernacle of David order or structure. He's raising up witness cities all over the earth. I think that there's like 12 of them. I heard somebody prophesy that once, and when I heard it, the Holy Spirit said, yes. There's like 12. I, th I believe we're one of them. For real. And it, he's saying, if you agree with that, I'll actually make you a witness to the whole world. Now, we are, we are a witness to the world in a way probably most of you don't understand. Noah, at one point in Noah's testimony during the intensive, he said, you know, God gave me this promise. I'm going to lead worship in front of thousands. I, I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but I do know this. He's teaching me how to trust him and wait on him. And then later that day, I messaged Noah, and I said, Noah, I know you, you weren't, this isn't what you meant, but just so you know, you have led worship in front of thousands, so have most of you, because thousands see that live stream. And I showed him this last month, there were like 1,800 views of the live stream. 
Like, it just never looks the way that we picture it in the flesh, you know? So we're like, it's not impactful. But God's like, it's impactful. Trust me. It really is impactful. Okay? Okay, so he wants to, he wants to raise up a witness of more stability, more keeping our, keeping our places, keeping our times, keeping our steadiness in more judgment. And, and more judgment is going to come. People are going to be paying more attention. I guarantee it. We have set prayer times. How many here have a set prayer time? You don't even have to have a set to have a set prayer time. You, you're like, I come at this time. We have set prayer times. We have set positions. Prayer leader, worship leader, elders. Do you know what matters more that you stay in your position than it does that you say the thing that you think you need to say? It actually, because the witness is not that we're all, we all know God more than everybody else. The witness is actually, I stay in my position. That's how you can tell I know God. I stay in the place God set for me, okay? This is hard to do. What I'm describing, it would take a miracle. Nobody does this right. Okay. But we can. We can do it better. We have set authority, which is seen by clear revelation. We actually know where, revela- where authority resides because we know where revelation resides among us. The pouring out of the Spirit really shouldn't violate that. It should actually be like, okay, God, you've gotten us ready to flow in this. We kind of know the parts of the body is what I mean. We discern the body. God doesn't pour out his spirit so we can be like, I don't even know any of these people, and I'm just going to try to figure out who I am right now in this small of intensity. No, we're supposed to know each other. We're supposed to be like, oh, that's where the authority resides because that's where the revelation resides, and God isn't a God of chaos. He's a God of order, and he wants us to actually flow with him. Let him put a little oomph on what we've been doing. Like, that's good. But if we take the oomph, we're like, let's do something totally different now. (laughs) He's like, why would you do that? Why would you do something totally different now? I'm actually touching the thing you asked me to touch. Let's stay with it, okay? Okay, so outpouring will either establish order or be diffused into reaction, depending on what we ask God for right now. Whatever we set our hearts prophetically to connect with, that's what we're going to get. So if we're like, whatever, I don't think he's going to do good or evil. Alice is Else was like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about Zephaniah. That's what he said. I'm going to search Jerusalem for those that say he won't do good or evil, and I'm going to destroy him. <laughs> so we don't want to be a people that are like, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see. We want to be a people that are like, the Bible says he's going to pour out his spirit. The signs say he's going to pour out his spirit. My friend Tom says he's going to pour out his spirit. All a bunch of my other friends say he's going to pour out his spirit. He's going to pour out his spirit. I want to get ready for that. I want to receive that. That's a good thing anyway. I want that to happen. So why don't I just receive it and get ready to connect, right? That means this week's prayer meetings make a lot of sense. And the way we carry ourselves into this building and carry ourselves out of this building make a lot of sense. And the way that we operate in a prayer meeting makes a lot of sense because we're getting ready for some oomph to get put on that thing and home runs to get hit. That's what we want. Okay, outpouring will either establish order or be diffused into reaction depending on what we ask God for now. Blow the trumpet. Joel 2, blow the trumpet. That means make a clear call together. That's what, actually what I'm doing right now. I'm blowing a trumpet with you. And we've been blowing the trumpet this whole meeting. He's been saying what I'm saying this whole meeting. That's supernatural. That's awesome. Consecrate. Decide now what this looks like for us. What's the difference between a fast and a diet? It's consecrated. A fast has a very specific beginning and end and a very specific thing I'm going to do. Just trying to not eat sugar indefinitely is not a fast. That's a diet. Consecrating something means it starts, it ends, and this is what I'm going to do to honor the Lord. I'm going to try my best to keep that. That's what it is. Consecrate. That's what, that's what Joel the prophet said. That the day of the Lord's coming. The Antichrist army's coming up on you. Consecrate something. Just say, God, it's weak. We're going to try it, though, and we're going to try to keep it. We're not going to do less or more than it. We're just going to do the thing that we said with you, and you're going to empower us to do it as best as a human being could do, filled with the glory of God, and then we're going to call you the glorious one who made it happen. That's awesome. That's what consecration means. Gather. Invite the willing into submission. I can't make anybody in this room see what I see. And I shouldn't. It's not, it's not righteous that I would do that. I'm not God. I can only gather to the extent you're willing. And I can only let myself be gathered to the extent I'm willing. So this is an invitation. It's voluntary. So many people will hear this and it won't change anything. Sanctify. Set apart the purpose of the meetings. Is this just like all prayer? No, it's actually, the, what's the purpose of the prayer meetings at Lighthop? It's the structure of David's tabernacle. It's actually to get in the structure of God's government. Let's sanctify that. Let's be like, okay, let's take that seriously. Yeah, I mean, we were immature before. We maybe didn't see that. Maybe we didn't know that. We're just finding that out. But 
what are we doing together? Let's sanctify it. You see what I'm saying? Assemble. Unify under God and, un, and then under delegated authority. Okay? I don't have to have it all work right. Like, if I see something that God and I are seeing together, I can stay under his authority. I can actually stay under his delegated authority and trust, this is the hardest one for me, and trust that this will work out right. Stepping out of the delegated authority of Light Hop in a very intentional way is pain. Because <laughs> I feel like I know how certain things should go. And God's like, you may be right and you may be wrong, but you're wrong if you're not under the authority. So just quiet down, son, and stay in it. Just stay with it. You see what I'm saying? That's what we should all be doing. We should all be like, okay, some's right, some's wrong. Good. That means we have to go. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. Let's go there together. Let's just go there together, right? And over time, I'll adjust, you'll adjust, we'll adjust, he'll adjust, and we'll become pure and spotless. That's what he's going for. Does that make sense? Joel 2. Oh, I'm sorry, Jay. God's only stated purpose. Everybody say only. I want you to check me on this because you're going to find that the world hates this. This is the statement the world hates. God's only stated purpose in the outpouring is to be seen in the order. We don't have prayer meetings to get revival to happen. Revival helps prayer meetings happen. It's way different. If you're like, we're just doing this until God does something that's amazing and then we're all going to love it, you're not, A, you're not going to love it. <laughs> you're going to hate it. And I've been there. You're going to hate it. And he's doing the thing right now. We're staying together. We're praying together. We're changing together. We're growing up together. We're learning new things together. We're learning how to, like, just be steady in judgment. Like, that's a, I mean, that's a miracle that we're learning how to be steady in judgment. That's a, that means we're going to be in heaven together. That's really good. I love that. If he does more than that, great. But if he's doing that, that's awesome, right? So God's only stated, only stated. Now, I'm not saying it's his only purpose. I'm saying it's his only stated purpose in the outpouring is to be seen in the order of self-control, love, faith, and hope of his people in power. And I'm going to prove that to you right here. Joel 2, 28 to 32. And it shall come to pass afterward. Afterward what? After my people get in one accord and learn order, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Has he done this before? Yes. Which flesh got it poured out in Acts 2? All the flesh that was trying to get in the order. You see? So that all means everyone that wanted it. All flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Who's doing all the stuff? God. Right? He's, he takes credit for all the prophesying. He takes credit for all the visions. He takes credit for all the men servants, maid servants. He takes credit for the wonders in the heavens, the fire, and the pillars of smoke. None of his return is on you. None of God's, re Jesus' return is on you. If it was on you, we'd all be doomed. Thankfully, it's on him. But we can be a part of it because we're part of his body, if we're part of his body. But if we're all the mouth or we're all the eye or we're all the head, then we're not part of his body, right? We're just our, we are whatever we are, touched by the Spirit, learning to coordinate movement and function led by one man, led by Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Uh, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before, I say before, the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. You're going to need the outpouring of the Spirit to get you ready to endure the trouble that's coming. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's what everybody should see when the Spirit's poured out. If we're doing it in a way that's helpful to Jesus' kingdom, they should be like, oh, I should call in the same Jesus that did that with those people. Right? If they're like, I need that guy to come to my meeting so I get that fire. No. I should call on the same God that those people were calling on, and they got touched by the thing they need. I need the thing. God, touch me a sinner. And then they were added to the meeting, 3,000 in one meeting, the day that God poured out his spirit on the order of the upper room. Do you see what I'm saying? Ten is symbolic of testing. They were tested ten days, just like Daniel and his friends were tested ten days, and then found to be faithful in a really intense environment, Right? We want that. We want to hear when all the spiritual people, the wise men, the counselors, when the decree is issued, kill them. We want to be the people that were tested today. So we're like, okay, God, what did the dream mean? <laughs> what was the dream? Right? That story of Daniel is a story about endurance and end time affliction and end time persecution and end time oppression. The entire book of Daniel is a story about the abomination of desolation. The entire book. 
We studied that back in 2018. Okay, so it shall come to pass that everyone who calls the name of the Lord shall be saved for in Mount Zion and Jerusalem. Now, primarily, God wants to show the order of spirit-led people to Israel because Jesus will not come back until Israel gets into this order, until they say from the Temple Mount a different prayer than they've ever prayed before, until they go up on the Temple Mount and instead of offering what they can, they say, give us the sacrifice, give us the lamb. We can't offer a sacrifice on this thing that's going to fix it, right? They're going to look at the lamb because we were looking at the lamb. Because we decided that his way of living was better than our way of living. That God was never asking his people to give him anything. We can't. What can we give God? He was always wanting to give us the thing we lack, which is leadership that's wiser than man's flesh. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for Israel to come to this realization, and it's pain. And she bore the Messiah for us, so we should be like, that's our people's. That's our people. And we don't want them to suffer without a witness of the order that all of creation is waiting for her to see. All of creation is groaning. All of creation is groaning that the sons of God would be revealed. This is what that means. The order. I got so excited. So God wants to show protesting Israel the order, peace, and power of those in Jesus. Right now. Do you know there is a witness in the church of the very same group movement that Israel is experiencing right now? Has anybody seen all the pictures and memes on the internet? Like, this monstrous group of people all getting saved. This monstrous group of people all experiencing the same thing. Not revival. That is not the way it works. Have you ever been in a stadium? There's all kinds of things happening in a stadium. You ever been in a church meeting? There were like... As many people are in this room, that says how many different things were happening here this morning. It's not all the meme. All of us are on the same page doing the exact same thing, and it's God. That's not true. And all the people protesting in Israel, the hundreds of thousands, they're all doing it for their own reasons. God is, if God's not leading you, you're doing it for your own reason. And I want to tell you, the road is narrow. If you find it, there's wheat and tares mixed together. Not everyone's doing these things for the same reasons. And that common sense should tell you that. Just being in the church for 20 years should tell you that, or 10 years, or however long you've been in it. You should be like, yeah, okay, let's put the meme aside. Get back into God. What are you saying? Order me, because literally Israel is mimicking some of the same behavior as the church, and there should be a witness that doesn't work like that. Israel, God knows your heart. All those 100,000 protesters in the city of Jerusalem last night, God knew each one of their hearts. He knew why they were there. He was the answer to it. And they're just finding group momentum being upset, being agitated, or being really unified. Like a lot of the pictures are just people being really unified, but not unified around the God that owns that city. And it's coming back to rule and reign no matter what anybody thinks about him. He's coming back to rule and reign Kalamazoo no matter what anybody thinks about him. But we can be a witness that we can know what he, what he thinks and what we think about him, right? We can know. We don't have to guess. Isaiah 42, 1 to 9. This is what God wants to show Israel. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He'll bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause, nor cause his voice to be heard. Now, can you imagine what church meetings would be like if everybody came, had their, the Holy Spirit on us, and we knew that it was going to bring justice. We didn't cry out, raise our voice, or cause our voice to be heard. That'd be a different kind of meeting. It's going to, that's the way the church is going to operate, I want to tell you, because it's, we're part of this body. We're part of this man's body. And he's sifting out everything that's not like him right now. And most of what gets sifted out will think it's getting sifted out in the name of God. He said, those who kill you will think they're serving God. They'll think they're the experts in God. But the real experts in God know they're babies. They don't know anything. God, just help me. <laughs> help me catch what you're doing. Help me flow with you. I want to connect at the right time. Change me, God. Change me, God. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flex he will not quench. That means he won't judge anything dead until it's actually dead. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. 
Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out. Here we come right back to this thing. He says, I caused the sun to rise every day. Do you think I left this one out of control? I didn't leave this out of control. Will you let me control you? Who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. Romans 11, 11, I say then, if they stumble, that they should fall. Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to you so that you can show them an order that they don't know. Raising the tabernacle is God's agenda right now. This is the last thing I'm going to say. about six minutes left. Outpouring is to raise the tabernacle, not the other way around. The flesh wants an impatient reward for the labor of prayer. This is delusion. You are privileged to get to talk to God. That's the reward. The reward is you have the ear of the one who made everything. That's the reward. And it doesn't feel like a reward to the flesh. So don't feel condemned if you're like, I don't feel rewarded when I'm praying. But we have to repent out of that. We have to actually be like, this is, this is the reward. Anything he adds on top of this is great. That's up to him. But the fact that I can talk to him and he hears me, that's the reward. Being a, <laughs> thank you. Being a stage leader is not the reward. It's only temporary to get people into the place of knowing God themselves. This is going away. This is going away. This is going away. I just thought maybe if I hit it hard enough, it would collapse right now. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> it's not going to do it, though. It's not, it's not time. It's not time. But it's going to go away. And oh, how that would break my heart and free my spirit, right? Free my spirit. That'd be good. We need it to. It would break my heart, though. Being a stage leader is not the reward. Being a known ministry isn't the reward. Talking to God and making space for others to talk to him, his first and second great commandments, that's the reward. Levites' only inheritance was God. They didn't have any land allotted to them. Their entire inheritance was the fact that they got to talk to God. That was their job. They got to talk to God. Many will come out of great tribulation. That's disorder. The great tribulation, I mean, just think about it. Tribulation means when I, I just baked something last week, and when I baked it, I had to shake it up and before I put it in the pan. That's tribulation. That's shaking. That's the movement. Okay, so the great tribulation or disorder into the tabernacle. God wants people to come out of the great shaking into the tabernacle, okay? And this is Revelation 7, 13 to 17. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. And they, so he, said to, he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great turmoil, the great tribulation, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They came into the kingdom. They came into the order, the, the righteous acts of the saints. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. Now, this is actually talking about you. You, you guys do this day in and day out. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Now, this isn't the end. Like, us coming here, this isn't the actual temple. Where's the actual temple at? Heaven. Yeah. The, the earthly temple, the New Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, that's a copy of what is actually real in heaven. So when you come boldly before this throne of grace in a new and living way, stirring up each other into love and good works, that, this is what you're doing. This is what you're doing. You're not serving each other. You're serving God. And you're, I mean, it's, we're his body. You're like washing, if you wash Abe's feet, you're washing Jesus' feet. If you're, you know, saying something true to Sam, you're saying something true to a part of the body to edify it, to like strengthen it. If you say something prophetic, right? And it's not, it's not, doesn't always feel like balm or medicine, but it is if it's prophetic, okay? Therefore, bef they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them, will dwell. Everybody say will. Okay, so they're doing something to connect with the thing that's going to happen. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. This is, this is people doing this on earth, connecting in the day of the Lord's return to the throne so that they're prophetically led by him to the streams of living water. Do you see? It's all promises, but reality. That's what you're in right now. You're in promises, but it's real, Right? I mean, we drink here sometimes. We feed here sometimes. We serve here sometimes. We prophesy here sometimes. But it's not the fullness. It's not the end. We're growing into something. So at just the right time, when heaven and earth, when Jesus joins all things together in heaven and earth, it's just a grand slam. It's like first resurrection. That's what Paul's like. I haven't gotten there yet. Like, my timing is a little bit off. But this one thing I do, I forget what's behind me. I keep trying. I keep running my race. God, bless you. God taught David how to come in and go out. Everybody say, come in. Everybody say, go out. We need to learn the same. There's a time to begin and a time to end. 
Never-ending meetings aren't in the Bible. I want to tell you this with clarity. Right now, there's a, a myth going around that you know God showed up when the meeting never ends. You won't find that meeting in the Bible. None. Zero. Even Solomon dedicating the temple after so many days, everybody went home. There is no never-ending meeting. That's a flesh desire. That is wanting to be completely out of control, have no responsibility, have God carry this whole thing. That won't save anybody. If, it, if that worked, he would just do that. What works to save people is getting them to voluntarily submit to his order and do things the way the world wouldn't do them. If a meeting feels like, oh, that would feel great, there's a good chance that's the flesh. If a meeting's like, I don't get why they're doing that, good chance that's the spirits involved somehow if they're manifesting the fruit of the spirit. I don't get why they would shut down the thing that's so full of power. They're quenching the spirit. No, you're quenching the spirit when you try to suck everything you can out of it. Nobody wants to be used like that. The Holy Spirit wants to be obeyed. He's not like a generac generator, right? He wants to be obeyed for real. Okay, never-ending meetings aren't in the Bible. God even rested from creation. Consecrated meetings have a set beginning and a set ending. 24-hour prayer, because you might be like, well, Tom, aren't we trying to go for a never-ending meeting? Yes, we are, actually. It's about body order, not the endurance of any one person. It's not about the flesh's endurance. 24-7 prayer is not about you doing more. It's actually about God doing more. David set times for 24 different teams to start and stop. It was just the beauty that they saw the vision of what David was laying out, and they were like, I want my part in it. I just want my place in it. It's, a, it's one of the most beautiful things I find about IHOP KC is this faithfulness to show up for their prayer set on stage and then spend hours in the prayer room enjoying somebody else's time on stage. Like, that's beautiful. I just think that's amazing. And that's what we should be growing into. We should be growing into this reality of, oh, I want to enjoy the overflow of the order of the, the finality, the beginning and finality forever. Like, it's finality, but never-ending finality. It's, like, so beautiful, right? It's like the days over and over. I mean, how many sunrises and sunsets has God created over and over? And he's not getting tired of it. He likes the order of it. He likes the process of it. He likes the beauty of it. You see what I'm saying? Great. I'm almost done. 30 more seconds. Okay, so Adam and Eve didn't spend all day with God. They met at a set time. After the resurrection, Jesus came and went. Peter wanted to stay on the Mount of Transfiguration, but God interrupted the flesh. So if you're like, I just want the never-ending meeting where the glory shows up and we just never go home, you're like Peter. That's good. He built the church on Peter. Like, that's great. Just, we had to mature into, okay, let's listen to what God's saying. This is what happened to Peter. But they constrained him saying, abide, oh, I didn't quote the Mount of Transfiguration. I quoted this different one. I must have taken it out. Okay, we'll look up the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, if you're interested in that. Luke 24, 29 to 31. But they constrained him, saying, abide with us. Now, this is the walk to Emmaus when those two guys were like, I don't know who this guy is, but my heart's burning. For it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. He went in and stay, to stay with them. Now, it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that they took bread, blessed it, broke it, he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. The Holy Spirit's going to do this. The Holy Spirit's going to give us what we need to stay faithful. Then he's going to say, now stay faithful. Stay faithful. That's what we're looking for, guys. Heaven's looking for people that want to stay faithful when their eyes don't see, their little hands don't feel, and their little hearts are like, I don't know, but I'm trusting this God. That's what the Holy Spirit pouring out is for. That's what God was calling those first disciples to stay faithful under persecution. If you want that, stand with me. We love a self-centered time. I wish Tim can come back up. We love a self-centered time where God does things. The flesh loves God doing and us being carried faithless. That's not the Lord. There's a power available to us to operate in a government available to us. The Holy Spirit is not the spirit of chaos or random. He's a, he isn't the lone wolf spirit. That's an immature understanding. The Holy Spirit is a service spirit, a humble spirit, a self-controlled spirit. Holy Spirit, in this room, we just want to be ready. God, we want to connect. When you join heaven and earth together, God, we want to be found in order. I just thank you that your kingdom's coming. Your will is being done on earth, even as it is in heaven. It's a process, God. It's growing, but I feel it growing in me. I see it growing in my friends. God, put some oomph on that grow. Put some oomph on that grow, God. 
put some power on that order. I just thank you for the way that we're trying to line up with you. He says, well done. Keep going. Don't stop. Forget what's behind you. Run this race. God, put grace on that race. Put grace on that race, God. Wings like eagles, they run and don't grow weary. I just declare it over you. This is one of the last things I get to declare over this place for months. Run, don't grow weary. Run, don't grow weary. He's going to give you grace, 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 grace. He's pleased. He is pleased. God, fill us up. Fill us up. Fill us up. 